So everyone, my name is Megan Taylor and I'll just be um, beginning this um, us off this morning. Um, so good morning and thank you for joining us today for this online presentation on the Eltham Copper Butterfly in the Wimmer region of Victoria. So just a little bit of housekeeping, if everyone can make sure they keep their microphone and camera off for the duration um, of the presentation just to limit disruptions. Um, if you're using the Teams link to watch this presentation, um, you can ask any questions throughout the presentation just using the chat box. It should be in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We'll be curating these questions and at the end, um, Elaine will answer these questions. Um, please note this is a Teams meeting and it is being recorded, so please do not record this presentation yourself. But if you'd like to view the presentation again at a later date, the recording will be available on the SWIFT website, which is www.swifft.net.au. Um, and if you're having any technical difficulties, difficulties throughout um, the presentation, um, you can email Annie Hobby and she'll place her email address in the chat for you. Um, I'd now like to begin with acknowledgement of country. So I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the tr traditional owners of all the lands wherever we join this presentation today. For me, I'm joining from the land of the Larrakia or saltwater people of Darwin, Northern Territory. But for those who live in the Wimmera and the focal area of today's presentation, this is the land of the Wachabolic, Jadwa, Jadwajala, Wagaya and Jabagog peoples. I would like to extend my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and any other elders who may be joining us today. I'd also like to recognise and thank them for the continued care and connection to the land that supports our beautiful elf and copper butterfly in the Wimmera region. Um, our speaker today is Elaine Bays. So I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to Elaine. Elaine has been working as an environmental scientist and ecologist since 1994. Elaine is the co-director and ecologist at Rakali Ecological Consulting, which operated from 2012 to 2020. Elaine, along with her partner, Damien Cook, established a not-for-profit trust in 2020 called Wetland Revival Trust. The Delft Biodiversity On Ground Action Icon Species Project for mapping the Eltham Copper Butterfly in Northern Victoria is one of the first projects to be run by the trust. Elaine has carried out flora and fauna surveys and written many management plans, particularly in the North Central region where she lives. Prior to this, Elaine was an environmental educator for 10 years, teaching conservation courses at TAFE and as an, the education and training manager for Green Australia Victoria. Elaine now focuses on wetland ecology and management, frog and reptile surveys, fire effects in the box iron bark, and elf and copper butterfly surveys and protection. Elaine was drawn into protecting the elf and copper butterfly due to the frequent planned burns being carried out at the largest currently known elf and copper butterfly population at Kalimna Park. Since then, Elaine has worked on the elf and copper butterfly as a volunteer and consultant, carrying out mapping and surveying the Kalimna Park population, as well as habitat mapping of over 2,500 hectares in North Central Victoria between 2010 and 2021, which included locating two new elf and copper butterfly populations in the process. So I'd like to give Elaine a warm welcome. I'm gonna give her a big rounding applause, which hopefully will work. And um, I will hand it over to you, Elaine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Megan, and thanks to everybody for your patience um, and uh, the technical problems. Um, yeah, today's talk was going to be in the Wimmera. I was supposed to be at the Dumbula RSL Club, so instead we're online because of all the COVID stuff. And um, so it's a real treat to be able to have people uh, outside the Wimmera learn about the Wimmera and a little bit about North Central Victoria and what's been happening here. Uh, can I ask first, we've got a little toll thing going because I can't actually see your face or speak to you. Is anybody from the Wimmera today other than Marinda? I can see Marinda's there. Any other people in the kit, the little poll, polling thing? Uh, just so I get an idea. I know some people couldn't make it um, and it's not a huge community. So uh, uh, um, yes. Okay, so I'm going to start. I'm just going to share my presentation and I'll get started. And, and I'm going to ask a few questions throughout so that you can um, have a little bit of interaction. Yeah, so I, I did change it from the Wimmera to Northern Victoria just because I had a look at the you guys and thought there was a few other people from different regions. So I'll uh, broaden it a little bit. So yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today. My talk is going to basically be, um, what do they look like? Where do you find them? what this project this year is about, 
the absolutely fascinating ecology. The results of the project so far, we haven't finished yet because it's flying season's just started. Um, what threats there are, what we're doing about managing them and monitoring them and how landowners can help. Uh, can I start, uh, if that little poll thing's working as well, although I can't see yet who's from the Wimmera, but has anybody in this group seen a Nelson Copper butterfly? Yeah, I know that Andrea Canzano, who's a guru of Elton Copper, is here, so she's seen more than any of us. Um, so if anyone Marinda's use, seen her. Use, oh, sorry, just to interrupt you, Elaine, if anyone, if we go back, you can scan the screen here with your phone if you've got it handy. And we've got a little poll going, so we can actually see online um, a few little questions just to get to know who's in the room today or in the virtual room. So. Yeah, if everyone wants to join in the little poll at the moment, that'd be great. Awesome, that's great. It just gives me an idea of uh, where people are at. It'd be very interesting. And I should say, if anyone hasn't seen it, this isn't real size, because if it was, it'd be quite terrifying. It'd be like sucking my, my blood out. They're actually tiny. <laughs> um, what's that look like? 50-50? It's probably going to keep moving. Okay. I'll flick back to it. If Megan can shout out what it is, that would be great. So um, if you can see my presentation again, I'll keep moving so that I don't keep you guys too late. Um, so uh, um, what I was going to say is the reason I got involved, as I said, was the burning at Kalimna Park. So one of the things we wanted to do was know exactly where they are rather than just a few dots on the map so that we could get involved in helping protect where the population actually occurs, particularly with burning, which is a threat just in this region. And um, so what do they look like? Um, and what is an AC? Well, Eltham Copper Butterfly or ECB. This is a this is the top the, the top upper wing and this is the under wing here. Uh, basically, it's a 100 400 species in Australia butterfly, 130 in Victoria, and the Eltham Copper Butterfly is one of 20 that are threatened, and three of which are extinct. So 15% of all butterflies in Victoria are are listed. Um, Eltham Copper Butterfly is the only one that's listed nationally under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So that's like the big the big sort of conservation guns. And so for that, there's a conservation advice on how to manage it. Uh, and it's actually from the Lycenidae, which is one of the blues family. And a lot of this talk on specific kind of ecology and that is actually generically about the blues, because most there's not that much research being done in butterflies at all. So we have to just kind of make assumptions that what applies to some blues also applies to the Eltham Copper butterfly. Um, uh, few, so few species have got management plans or action plans, including this one. And nowadays, entomologists are as rare as the butterflies themselves. Um, yeah, and I should mention in the past, most of this work was driven by uh, Alan Yen, uh, uh, Dr. Alan Yen and Professor Tim New, who were like, you know, amazing entomologists uh, who have since passed or retired. And yeah, it would be fantastic if more projects involved insects so that we could have more entomologists in the future. Uh, I have to say this because uh, in the North Central, it, basically what we've done is uh, there's three of us who are really passionate about protecting threatened species. So there's a little group called uh, sort of North, North Northern Victorian ECB Recovery Team, which is myself, Julie Radford and Cal Eust. And Julie made me put this slide up because she said this is only one of 13 and I shouldn't forget all the other ones. <laughs> so here we go. This is what it looks like. Basically, you can see by that beautiful shot that Andrea took in the middle. It's basically the size of a sort of 10 cent piece or a dollar. Um, and that one, that C marking has been penciled on. So that isn't a marking. That's just uh, one of Andrea's projects. So the one above it is what the underwing looks like. It's very drab, a uh, good camouflage, but when it wants to catch sun or, you know, it wants to maybe scare away a predator or whatever, it opens up its wings. And on the right hand side, you can see it's got the gold on the upper wing and on the lower wing. Uh, and down the, the, you can see it more easily maybe on the bottom left. It's got two brown triangles right at the base of the bottom wing. Uh, and, and that's quite a distinctive feature because some of the, there's two other species that can look very like it, depending on where you live. Um, also, the males and the females are slightly different. The one in the left down the bottom, this is from the Ross Fields but, uh, Victorian butterflies. They've got little points on their wings, the males. And on the right hand side, that's rounder wings and a kind of fat abdomen, probably full of eggs as the female. And they've got little clubbed antenna with little red bits on the end as well. 
Uh, they're very hard to see. I mean, one of the reasons it's probably uh, comes and goes and we think it's extinct and it's not extinct or is because you really can only see these flying from November to December uh, and potentially dribbles into up to March in some populations in some seasons when it's hot. They're solar powered, so you'll only see them when it's above 20 degrees, not too hot or they'll, over, they'll, they'll overcook, so less than 35 degrees. Can be too windy and preferably a cloudless day. So it's a difficult species and you have to basically keep your Christmas free because in the North Central, they peak at Christmas in numbers. Could be slightly different in the Wimmera where it's a little bit hotter. So it might maybe the numbers the numbers change a bit. And this year it's even weirder. They haven't started flying yet here, although Marinda saw them start at whale in small numbers recently. Um, how many people had said they'd seen them, Megan? I think we only had two people um, who polled two it. Two people, wow. That'll be Andrew Canzano and Miranda. <laughs> um, so two species, it's a few species that you've got to look out for. I get people saying, oh, there's thousands of them in my yard. And I'll, and I'll be like, oh, this is what they're talking about. It's a common brown, double the size, has obvious big purple, uh, big eye spots. And it's uh, not got the brown margin around the outside, as you can see from the top right. So it's pretty different. However, these next two are actually quite similar. And this occurs uh, at Kiata. So in the Boss Ironbark, I've never actually come across this because you don't tend to get grasslands and you don't really get an awful lot of uh, oxalis, which is what the larval, the larvae of this species feeds on. But you can see from that thing that it's really fringed around the outside and it's got no copper to speak of on the, on the bottom of the wing. And then when it closes its wings, it's got those orange patches. So subtle, but uh, different. And anybody who lives who's south of the Divide, mainly in the wetter region, this is another species that looks very similar. It's called the bright copper. And it's also on Bursaria, so uh, tricky. But again, you can kind of see that the, the copper doesn't go down to the ends of the, the tips of the wings, and it doesn't have the um, black kind of V spots. So it's tricky, but uh, again, you don't get these in Casamine, and you, well, generally, and you don't get them in the Wimmera, but I thought I'd better mention. So if you go out in the field to look for them, I've developed this Eltham Copper Lookalike sheet with uh, some wet and all funding we got a couple of years ago, just to help you. And you can save it onto your phone. And I'll have that on our new website, which sh should be up shortly. Um, and the other thing that's amazing that I've just started using is Butterflies Australia app, uh, which is a has a field guide on it. There's not a lot of photographs yet, but you can also record your surveys. So it's actually quite an amazing resource. Uh, so yeah, get them get them on your phone. So where do they occur and why are they endangered? So basically, this is where they occur now. I mean, and to be honest, in, they could occur in other places in between these, particularly in any remnant patches. So there's a lot maybe undiscovered tiny populations within those patches. But as far as we currently know, they only occur in three regions and 25 tiny populations within the regions. So Eltham and Greensboro, which is the famously why it's named Eltham Copper Butterfly, much to the chagrin of all of us Northerners. Uh, so it occurs down there, and uh, Andrea can maybe correct me, but on something like eight or ten, so maybe ten individual small blocks surrounded by subdivisions, which I think make up less than maybe ten or fifteen hectares. Uh, so there's so that's that population, and they've got a Facebook page and a really active, amazing group of people who've been dedicated to them for years. Uh, if you want to get involved. And then you've got them in Casamine and Bendigo, again, scattered through the uh, mostly national parks and tiny little pockets of 50 to 100 individuals. And we're increasingly finding more. One was found in uh, uh, Bendigo by Collab and Water uh, a couple of years ago, a little, po and there's only like five or something they've seen. And then lastly, uh, the area that I'm trying to kind of promote this year is uh, the Wimmera, who are often neglected in, in, as far as studies go, is a uh, Kiata and Whale and Salisbury, where, they, where they've been sort of discovered since 1988. So three different populations, as you can see, totally and utterly separated from each other genetically. So butter Elfencore butterflies, one of the reasons they're so endangered, well, A is, Obviously, land, like the same as most other species, is land clearing. 66% of Victoria's uh, forests and um, woodlands have been cleared. And in the box ironbark, where they occur, that's, that's 75%. So 
and then when we're at, so obviously at clear for agriculture in Melbourne, it's clear for uh, urbanisation. So that's the number one reason. Um, the other reason is they've actually got quite a tricky, uh, narrow distribution of and requi uh, complex requirements, which we'll talk about later. But uh, one of the reasons that these three are totally separated is they can only really, apparently, uh, through Andrea Canzano's little tagging and release, they don't fly very far. It's only like maybe 180, 200 metres. So there's no way they're going to get an hour and a half drive from uh, Eltham to Casamain and then three hours to, to, to the Wimmera. So they're genetically isolated. Uh, yep, and so a brief history. So basically, it's interesting trying to get the history because the, some things will say uh, that they were formally described in 1951 from from around Deltham's specimens between 1923 and 56 by David Crosby. But when you look at the VB, the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, which records all in all species. There's actually records from Dumbula from 1907, from Kiata, all through the 50s. Um, so I think the tools we have now really help us know this information quickly. But in 1951, it would have been difficult to know who'd seen them where and get that, and to get all that communicated to each other. So I'm very grateful today for the tools that we have that make it easier. But basically, uh, David Cosby described it formally because it's a subspecies of, of, a, of um, another another copper. Uh, and he he named it, called it Eltham Copper Butterfly, because that's what it was found as part of a subdivision. And basically the community rallied, which is pretty unusual for a for an invertebrate, rallied for it and protected all those blocks that I mentioned before. And then despite Crosby looking for it, he didn't see it at any of the sites where he knew it to occur before. And a lot of those sites had been cleared. And so he presumed that it was extinct until it was found on that Eltham Copper subdivision. That triggered the government into looking for it. So in 1988, an amazing report and research project led by Patrick Vaughan searched for it across Victoria. And it's an amazing report, even though it's quite old now. And he found it at Kiata in the Wimmera, Salisbury in the Wimmera, and in Casamine Botanic Gardens, where it's hanging on to this day. In um, 1991, it was listed under the State Act as threatened. Sadly, since 1994, Salisbury, which is was grazed, and uh, there's hardly any shrubs in that left in there, it's believed to be extinct based on two surveys. And in um, 2002 to 2012, it was discovered by Fabian Douglas in Whale on a roadside. And Bendigo and Casamina, we've found quite a few little populations, maybe about eight. And now it's protected under the EPBC Act. So like that picture before where it's protected to three regions, when you look at Whale, and I've actually really enjoyed going up there and learning all, all these and trying to find all the old reports and old data often that aren't on the VBA, it's really quite fascinating. So again, it's like the Melbourne graph. There's three populations that are all totally physically separated from each other. So it's like the genetics have been watered down once again. You've got the Salisbury one there, which is only 12 hectares. And the most that have ever been seen there is four, which the last was 1993. Two people have looked since. Uh, Kiara, that's like, a, what's that, 90 hectares. And it's got quite five little subdivisions, five little pockets of uh, populations in them that Patrick Vaughan uh, discovered and has been sampled twice since. And then whale discovered in 2011, which is basically just a roadside of about three hectares. And we'll be working uh, this year on all these sites. And Marinda, who's listening now, is uh, working on them too. Casamine's sort of similar, but actually probably more connected. We found one, two, three, four. We've got five populations. Uh, like we said, three of which were discovered in that 2011 statewide search. And there are still dots on the map because they were never resurveyed. Uh, so there's a lot of work should have probably happened afterwards, which uh, which we didn't, but which we've got funding to do now, which is fantastic. Kalimna Park we've, we've mapped, and I'll show you that. And, Kal and Botanic Gardens, I do study, uh, and they're declining down to four from 100, and we're just trying to work out why now. Bendigo, same as Castlemaine, lots of populations, potentially, uh, I'm going to say lots, each of these have not got that many species, maybe 50 to 100 within each one. So pockets paper through the landscape. And Casamine and Bendigo, that actually shows you what they believe to be a meta population. But it's like you've got uh, little pockets of them scattered through the landscape, but they don't occur in huge numbers in one particular spot. So it's a good, so the whole theme of this is you've got to protect broader habitat to manage this species, not just where they occur. So what's this project about? Basically, there's little knowledge 
so the now we've just got one red dot, say in the Dingle Park Road population at Shooting. It's a red dot, we saw them here, and that's it. But we don't know where they extend to so that you can actually manage them. So locating locating where they exactly are means I can negotiate it with the land managers on protecting them, particularly in this area from planned burning. In the Wimmera, it'll help us know where to fo focus efforts like weed management and grazing, which is what their threats are. Um, and then the second thing is we've got so many places we haven't searched for them, as you can see from the findings of, you know, finding eight in 2011, from searching and finding all the ones in 1988. So we're going to be searching for new ones again uh, in places so far unsearched. Um, so, because with ongoing degradation in land clearing and burning, the need to recognise, document and protect the remaining biological diversity has become more urgent than ever. All these remnants that are around, they've all got threatened species on them. So by uh, protecting them for elf and copper butterfly, we're also actually protecting them often for orchids and other rare species that occur there. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you this. This is an example of what I'm about. The, and this is this work we did in 2020 for the Jajawarung is part of a flora and fauna survey of um, Kalimna Park and Wildflower Drive. So Kalimna Park, all these little dots on the left diagram is the kind of map that we had prior to this survey, which showed all historical records of autumn copper butterflies. If I went to land and fire, say in a fire situation, or even anyone to try and get funding, say for weeds or whatever, where do you focus your efforts and where do these populations extend to? We didn't actually know, and no one had ever, they actually all relied on just members of the public, really, going out, or, and sometimes uh, the department. Uh, I think Peter Johnson probably went out a few times from Delk Bendigo. But they're ad hoc. Uh, you didn't really know where, where it extended to. So we developed this method that was basically copying exactly what Professor uh, Tim New and Alan Yen developed in 2011, where we went and found all those 2011 populations, where, you, where we basically walked whole sites and transects with a handheld GPS, and we GPS Bursaria patches. It's it sort of resulted in a bunch of dots, so it isn't as good as this because now we've got better mobile phone tools where you can actually know that you're in a grid. So I've adapted that old method sometimes because I was walking in circles because my navigation's chronic, and old GPSs had no maps on the back of them. You're just looking at a grey screen. So this is much more rigorous with a, using a Venza. Uh, we had a georeferenced 50 metre grid map across the whole site and we walked it and basically said how dense a patch of Bursaria is in each one. So the, the bright orange uh, colour, that's 50 plus Bursaria plants in that 50 metre square. The lighter orange is 10 to 50 plants. The creamy colour is less than 10 and the clear squares is none. So you can see straight away that of what it was, uh, 292 hectares, 76 hectares is the density ones, the, the two darker orange colours. So you've gone from, my, from me asking Delp to say not burn 292 hectares to saying don't burn 73 hectares. And then if you look at where what squares the elephant copper butterfly actually land in, it comes down to eight hectares. But as we said before, you can't just manage eight hectares because you're actually relying on a broader environment so they can shift about, move around a few hundred metres and as resources come and go, they'll move with it. And you actually, I need the ants requirements to, you know, there's so many codependencies that stretch out into the ecosystem that you have to manage the the, the greater area. So the 73 hectares would be as a, sort of as a minimum. But so it really does give you clarity about where they exist. So this is what we wanted to do for all the known populations, uh, especially in Kiata and the and the and, and potentially Salisbury and Wales, so that we can rigorously protect them with limited budgets. Uh, Okay, so this is a habitat surveys I've done at Kiata, which Marinda, who's who's listening, has done on my behalf because I, I really wanted to try and uh, not go in and do this surveys. I really wanted to get get some passion back into it from local local so that it's managed long term. But the left hand side is Salisbury. That's a tiny little twelve hectare patch, and then as you go into the middle there, the other shaded part there with the yellow around it is Kiata. And the blue lines are roadsides that we've also gridded to see if there's any way, any linkages or any way of connecting those two up. And then looking at what other potential sites, there's three blocks of Durang Durang there, which uh, in the future would be worth checking to see if there's any um, any elf and copper butterflies in there. A lot of these spots have been checked in the past uh, ad hoc, or maybe for an hour or two hours. But this sort of mapping means you can actually go in and look exactly where the Bursaria are rather than look around where there's maybe not that many. 
Uh, this is the one at Whale, that tiny red line there is the sort of three hectares, which we've measured now that Fabian Douglas found, which is just on a roadside, maybe 200 metres by 50 metres wide. And the, all those other roadside areas that we've also gridded up and uh, searched. And the majority of the work has been done in Castlemaine and, uh, and uh, Bendigo, well, mainly Castlemaine for this round of funding. Um, and this is basically a huge one example of many places we've looked. We've searched in 1,200 hectares, and Michael, who's listening, is one of the volunteers for that. And this is again the red is the dense dispersed area, the orange not you know 50 to 50, 20, 10 to 50, the yellow less than 10, and the grey is all none. So this totally validates the research that said that that you only really get bursaria scattered across the landscape. And even where there is bursaria, you only get butterfly, elfin cob butterfly in three to 26% of what appears to be perfect habitat. So even within all this, it'll only be a fraction of it that's got the butterflies in it. And you can see on the far northeast, there's red dots there. That's the elfin cob butterfly that I discovered in 2011. And then down in the opposite area in the, in the southwest is another population at Campbell's Creek that we discovered in 2011. So this is an example of where we want to know how far does it extend. It obviously can't link up because that middle section ha has got hardly any bursaria in it. So where does it extend to and what can we negotiate management for? And these, this is a terrible map, but this kind of shows you all the 1,200 hectares that we've done from Walmar, which is a big burn area that's coming up this year. The red dots are Kalimna Park, that's the and butterflies, all through Tewton, Quartz Hills, um, yeah, large area. Uh, other parts of the project are this talk, which is supposed to be in Kiara, but online talk, and then we'll have a field trip in Kiara on, uh, on the 24th of uh, November. Uh, we've had to do, we've produced three media releases. One's going to be in Landcare Victoria. I was interviewed by the ABC, uh, and we've got the website, which will be coming up soon. Because if we can't get the community to care about species, then the government aren't going to fund it. So the really uh, every, uh, get having the community involved and passionate is central to any of these projects. So this is a bit that got me going. So this is a, you know, I'm not an entomologist, but the, the reason it's sort of a drawing me in is it's just an example of one species that is so interconnected and, we, and as many species are, but we don't know mostly, we don't know hardly anything about nature and how complex it is. But this one gives you an idea of the amazing intricacy of nature and how it's all interconnected. And to me, it's a flagship of how this is happening for every, all the other insects of which there are a ridiculous number of. And that's why it's important to me because it doesn't, not so much for the species itself, but the fact that it represents what's going on on remnants on many levels. And so all remnants are worth protecting. So and saying that, why, what's amazing about this one? Well, this picture shows you that's a elfin copper butterfly larvae and all those ants that are crawling all, all, all over it are one species of Natonchus ant, which is a <coughs> predatory ant that's nocturnal, only comes out at night, lives underground. And basically it's tending that larvae and protecting it from threats. And it's the elfin copper butterfly is totally dependent on them because otherwise the predation of juicy little morsels like them is really high without having some uh, bodyguards. The ant isn't dependent on them. They'll feed on all sorts of things, and particularly seeds. They, they're really um, reliant on, it's called aliosome seeds, seeds that have an arrow or something that attracts the ant to eat. To eat. So um, they, they defend the elfin cob butterfly larvae, their eggs, their pupae, while, the, while they're resting in the, in the nest, and also when they're out at night uh, grazing on the, on the sweet bursaria plants. And in return, the ants get a sugary, a uh, sugary drink from almost from the area where that top one is, from the sort of eighth part of its abdominal segment. Yeah, the species that look after them in the Wimmera is different from the one in Casamine and Eltham. One's that Ectatomoides in the Wimmera, and the other one's Capitatus. So they basically, if you look carefully, and this is Carl Eust's picture, uh, th that's a picture of the base of a sweet bursaria plant, and that's the ant nest. And interestingly, uh, the only, because the blue family, 79% uh, of the blue family have got a relationship with ants and half of them, they have to have the relationship, it's obligate relationship with ants and the other half, you know, they might have a relationship with some part of their life cycle, but not super reliant on it. So the blue, so these ants, some of the blues actually eat the ants, uh, you know, babies uh, or immature ants. 
So in order to be protecting that, it's very cleverly, the only ants that you get in that in that nest are worker ants. There's no queen and there's no brood. They'll be somewhere else. Again, showing you why you have to manage the broader landscape because that colony will be elsewhere. So the elton the female elton cob butterfly lays eggs down at the base, uh, near the nest, on the branch or uh, on the stem or in the mulch. Uh, once And once they hatch, um, you know, pheromones are there or an attracting way of getting the ants to immediately attend, the, attend them and actually take them, not take them, but walk with them down into the bottom of the nest. Some species do actually get carried, but we believe the elder copper butterfly makes its own way down. And they will stay in the nest, you know, and be protected until they, until after they pupate and emerge, only coming out at night to feed. Um, there's little known of ant ecology. In fact, when you try to research Natonkas, there's so so little knowledge about most ant species, even though Australia's got you know mega diverse ant populations. And especially considering the unbelievable amount of ecosystem services that they provide. Uh, that bottom right hand picture is a uh, uh, tatamoides. It's got those really spiny spiny back. And then the third relationships you've got the butterfly, the ant, and then the plant. Uh, so this is sweet bursaria. Uh, um, the eltham cod butterfly larvae only eat sweet bursaria leaves, totally exclusively. And the eltham cod butterfly <clears throat> predominantly drink the sweet bursaria nectar, and that's why they mainly emerge. The adult butterflies only emerge in November and December, which is when the bursaria is flowering. Um, and I'm sure there's a complex relationship with when the butterflies come out to know when that's happening, but I've got no idea what that is. Uh, like I said before, the larvae... Uh, distribution in a site may vary between years and seasons as they maybe move through the landscape, a very, very small move through the landscape to chase resources. Um, I mean, a couple of hundred metres. Uh, like Castle May Botanic Gardens actually shift from one ridge to another that's a couple of hundred metres apart. Um, and the Bursaria health varies between seasons and that will totally affect the growth of the, of the, of the larvae down there. Now, one thing that totally confused me in the past was they used to have two, they used to say uh, Bursaria spinosa, spinosa or Latiophila and say they were two species. And so they would refer in reports to dwarf Bursaria. And in Castlemaine in North Central, all our Bursaria is like a, a shrub, one and a half metres, two metres, maybe a tall scrappy three metres, but it's a shrub. But this is near Lake Rats Castle in the Wimmera, and that is a Bursaria plant <laughs> and with a huge trunk. And um, so obviously, even though they're the same species, uh, there's totally different growth forms. So when they say dwarf form, they don't mean this one because larvae can't climb trees. Took me ages to work that out. Um, so the butterfly, as I said, they don't travel far. The females particularly often remain close to where they were. They came out from their pupae. Um, they're not everywhere, even in good habitat. They're only occurring for some, we don't know why, but in a 3 to 26% of where you find them. The plant and the ant are more wide, widely distributed. Uh, and there's a lot of debate about two generations a year because you get them flying now till Christmas in, in Casamain, the peak in Christmas day, and then they'll decline into January. And then there'll be nothing, nothing, nothing. And then there might be a little flutter of maybe a third of the population in uh, April, May. And there's a bit of debate about whether that's this year's just rapidly growing or last year's still coming out. So it's, they call it two different kind of generations. Um, the female... The female uses little spurs on her feet that, to prick the to prick the leaves so that she knows it, when she's laying what what plant to lay eggs on. A is it nutrition in, uh, nutritious enough, and B does it have the ant pheromones? This stuff fascinates me, but I can't actually find any information on it other than Patrick Vaughan's report in eighty eight, which is quite old. But I'm sure uh, it's just this is what gets me excited because it's not just those three things. It's probably a hundred things, and we just don't know what they are. You know, the habitat, and this is from the Patrick Vaughan report, is that the habitat of the Elton Cobra butterfly is home to many other organisms which potentially affect the population levels. You know, the plants, what other flowering plants there are for the for the adult butterflies to eat, what predators are there, what parasites are there, what other insects are there. So, so for example, Natonchus also tends scale insects and aphids, and they've found lots of mealybugs and things also in the nest that are looked after by an, another ant called, uh, which is a meat ant, and they're quite aggressive. So they potentially scare away Natonkis ants if you had mealybugs in the nest, and Patrick Vaughan didn't see any plants with mealybugs in that had elf and cover butterflies. So it's incredibly complex. Um, 
and, and so protecting the broader habitat is important. Like that picture there is a desert uh, banks here, uh, desert hake, sorry, in the in the Kiata. But when we went to Kiata recently, even though that's mentioned as they've been looking like it was important at Kiata and butterflies have been seen drinking off it, uh, as far as I could see, we, we couldn't see any of them. So if something disappears from the landscape that's critical food, you know, that's why you have to protect the broader environment. That top right hand photo I took recently at Salisbury, a lot of the plants up there have got that weird gall or uh, inflammation of the leaves. Uh, I don't actually know what that is, but again, it's going to impact on health because a lot of those leaves drop off. Um, introduce honeybees, it actually says in the Patrick Vaughan management plan and maybe the conservation advice that honeybees should be excluded from any any places where elf and copper butterfly populations live because they will preferentially drink Bursaria uh, nectar, so they'll com compete for uh, resources. So it's bloody fascinating. I, lo I love all that, uh, the detail of that. Uh, again, Andrea's listening. That's her photograph on the top left hand side that she kindly shared. That's a huntsman eating a lar an elf and cobra fly larvae. She probably had a heart attack when she was taking that photograph and wanted to pull it out of his mouth. Um, birds obviously eat the adult butterflies, uh, hence they can use the copper to kind of flash at them to, to sort of surprise them. As I said, other ants competing with the Natronchus ants. Um, wasps can be a predator, but basically the majority uh, in the Michael Baby's, Michael Baby's uh, butterfly book, the, he believes the majority of things that control the elephant butterfly populations generally are parasites. And that bottom left hand corner is a gross picture of a butterfly larvae. And what's happened is uh, a wasp, a very small wasp, like a small native wasp, is what's called a super parasite. It hasn't just laid one egg in that in that, that caterpillar. It's laid a lot, and that all those little hairy, fluffy things are basically the larvae have come out of the butterfly caterpillar and and formed a cocoon so they can fly off as wasps. So all these things is uh, happening all the time, and that is what the ants protect the the butterfly larvae from. So. Studies of the Imperial Hair Street pupae where ants were denied, 95% of wasps parasitized them. Conversely, those that were attended by ants, zero parasitism. So having the ants is pretty critical. So at the moment, underground uh, and, and Eltham cover butterfly are basically at the larval stage. So they're the caterpillar underground eating as much as they can, increasing their body size from 60 to 200 times uh, and and shedding their skin and having five inch stars in the process. So they'll be ready to pupate, which take, which will, and then they'll come out any day soon. And usually they would be out by now, but weird weather, uh, into the butterfly. The butterflies will fly around and all they'll do is eat and have sex and lay eggs as soon as they physically can. So here's the one that we're waiting for. We're just waiting for this to come out so that uh, the adults will basically, all their life is about is feeding, mating, defending territory if you're a boy, and she has to find the right plant to lay eggs on. And Andrea, who's listening, she's done an amazing amount of work to try and find out how long they live by the tag and release, which is what that little mark was on the butterfly on the coin. So the females, she found a maximum of 11 days that they lived and a maximum of 28 days for the boys. And she also actually caught more, more boys than girls, so they've also got different behaviour that make them the females a bit harder to catch. So they'll come out anytime soon. They'll lay these eggs. It's a one mil by half a mil at the base of the sweet bursaria. Uh, and two weeks after that, a tiny little first instar larvae will, will come out. And that's a picture of the larvae here. And five sort of growth spurts later, uh, potentially this year they might fly in April, May. I'm not actually sure how quickly this happens. But mostly I think they, they say that they overwinter till next spring. So they will eat, eat, eat now while it's warm enough. And as soon as it gets too cold, they'll just stay down in the ant's nest over winter, only coming out when it's sort of 15 degrees at night to feed when they can, which is mainly September, but mainly they get active in September. So you could go out at night now if you knew where the butterflies were and you'll see these crawling around at night and they'll always be attended by ants. And then when whatever tells them, some magical complex interaction tells them it's ready to pupate, then off they go and they'll pupate, forming this hard, hardish, crusty kind of uh, metamorphosize into butterflies at the end of the day and that takes three to five weeks. So what do they do to defend themselves in the middle of all these vulnerable things because they're at every single stage of them is vulnerable to being attacked by something or parasitized. 
Um, the adults, you know, they can they can flash their wings to to frighten something that's going to try and attack them. They'll fly off. Uh, like um, I was talking to Fabian Douglas, who's an entomologist from the Wimmeran. He saw a couple mating at Kiata, and a meat ant came up to them, and they'll just take off, stop mating, take take off as fast as you can. Um, they may use the pheromones. So there's been reports, and a lot of this is anecdotal from from a. Uh, uh, amateur people like you know like ourselves who are just keen and not entomologists but observational stuff where they say uh, a female was laying eggs and the ants come out aggressively but then started to calm down and maybe pal they, they could have palpated her with their with their antennae which showed people maybe they're given pheromones off when they're given when they're laying eggs and they can also flake off scales uh, as can the pupae because they've got a kind of hairy surface so they can do that if some ants come to attack them in the when they're when they're in the nest, they can wool can come off to tangle up the ants, the ants chewing parts. Uh, the pupae can release chemicals, and they even think they might have that sugary that sugary nectar gland that gives off uh, sweet juices to feed the ants. And they actually make noises that you can hear. They can make drumming noises, or they can actually move their abdomen to grate two bits together that can uh, either attract ants to defend them or scare away other things. But it's quite incredible. But the thing that, that I find the most incredible, this is the most vulnerable stage. You know, there's such juicy morsels, not that I've tasted one, but that they're uh, apparently juicy morsels. So they've basically got, they're totally adapted for living in that nest and things that would normally eat them. So their skin's 20 times thicker than any other kind of caterpillar. Uh, that, that kind of grey thing that on their head, they can actually pull their head under that and that's a hardened plate. Um, you know the skin can stretch, uh, and each each instar as it changes, it is turning more and more into an adult butterfly. Like wing buds are developing, organs are developing. I was actually quite disappointed to hear that uh, the pupae isn't all just turned into mush and regrows into a butterfly. Each instar is kind of getting more and more developed uh, until the final instar. They've obviously got legs. They've got they can make silk from their lips, and they're basically chewing tons of food and putting it back into the soil as fertilizer. And all butterflies and moth larvae are all incredibly valuable to the food system as far as food goes. If you zoom in on these, like if you're a vulnerable, juicy thing and you're living in an ant nest with all other species and things, it's like, how do they get those ants to follow them around and protect them? Like it's incredible adaptation, I'm sure over, you know, thousands, millions of years. But the, the butterfly larvae themselves, they're actually covered in all sorts of different glands and uh, organs that we don't know 100% what they are. Like this information is on blues generally, but I can I think you can assume that the elfin copper butterfly has these. But if you look at that picture with the pink lips, that pink lips uh, is a dorsal nectary organ, which is on the eighth, eighth abdominal segment of the, the of the larvae, and that basically secretes uh, carbohydrates, amino acids, and sugar, which is a uh, potentially for some reason extremely exciting to to these natronchus ants. And so they'll follow them about with them night and day and protect them in the nest just to get that. And what's even more unbelievable is people have studied it. And if you've got, like, say, also, say at Casamine Botanic Gardens once, I saw 36 larvae on one plant. If there's 36 larvae out, apparently the, the larvae don't produce as much sugar because they don't have to because there's a ton of ants out protecting them. So they'll actually adjust how much sugar, how much nectar they'll produce depending on how many ants they need to protect them. So that's one way of attracting bouncers. And the other way of attracting them uh, is they have all those little red crusty look like warts. They're another kind of gland called that poor capoli, capoli. And they produce a chemical and we don't really know whether it attracts or appeases the ants. Because often the ants behave like, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll palpate the, the, the eggs of the small larvae with their antennae like they do with their own uh, progeny. So they think that they're producing chemicals that mimic that particular ant species of brood hormones. And I'm like, Jesus, I mean, how long does this stuff take to happen? It's amazing. And again, bottom left hand side is another type of gland, which we don't actually know what it does. But again, a, a, a peas or attract ants. And it's got like, it's like an anemone thing that can pop out with the little uh, sort of hairs or seti on it to release chemicals. So it's, it's all trickery and treats. Um, uh, then you got, just take my time here. Then the, um, so the males and females behave differently. When you go out looking for these, the way that you do it is you basically wait until November, December, find one of the dense patches, either by using the maps that we've done or just by knowledge of your area. 
And with a stick, you've got to tap each plant because often they're sitting resting and you can't see them. So you tap, tap, tap on the plants and you'll see them fluttering up. Uh, and if another male or another female comes in, you'll see them do a big spiral up into the air. But generally, they'll come back close or come back to the area that you're, you were standing in. Like Andrew said, most of those ones you'll see are males because they're actually on the hunt for females and they're patrolling an area, whereas the females that are a wee bit more sedentary and uh, a bit harder to find. Um, mating, as we said, is a priority, and the males really want to make sure that they have that they give that the, the girl their sperm, and no one else gets it. So they've got quite a few methods, which uh, to me is another astounding thing. Uh, not just because it's rude, but uh, it's just mind-boggling. Um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. But so she has to try and find the perfect spot. Too dry, and the eggs will dry out. Too wet, and they'll get mouldy. And it's got to be really close to the larval plant so that the larvae can get down into the nest ASAP. And this is just a quick kind of thing that I just find mind boggling. So the female gets gets sperm. She's got her eggs already. So the male's job is just to try and find a female. And he mates with the female by giving her a package of sperm, which is in an indestructible Christmas present wrapping that she can't get digest very quickly. So he gives her this package because she want, he wants her to only mate with him. So the longer it takes her to break this down, the less likely she will be to mate with someone else. So it's got these complex proteins on it that she that, that scientists have tried to break down. And they had to boil it in concentrated acid, concentrated sulfuric acid to break down the outside of it. And the inside of it's full of full of a, a sweet, uh, a sweet uh, um, nutritious protein. So he's given her a protein package that she needs to have the energy to lay eggs, which actually takes up like 13% of his body weight. So for a man, that's 20 litres. So it's a huge effort to produce this spermatophore. So when he puts this inside her, the males swim out because they know they're about to get, they swim it into another part of her genitalia, they call her bursa, and be protected while she tries to break this thing down. But she's also, they've actually found that he builds this inside her while he's mating with her. And even though it's like a, a chemical war game, where as he's building this indestructible package, she's actually sneakily slipping in proteases that break down the protein as he's building it. So there's like a, a war going on to see, because she wants to mate with someone else so that she can get as much protein as she can. And the reason that they're attractive is, this is a photograph of a cabbage white, and butterflies mainly... They mainly they're not so interested in color. Ultraviolet is the mainly way they see things. So they will see that keep that normal cabbage white on as the right hand side. They'll see it as bright purple, and that tells the female that that particular butterfly has got a lot of protein. The more color, the more protein. The more color, the more protein. The more proteins in his sperm package. So it's just mind boggling. Oh, she's also got a grinding clay inside her genitals that. Uh, that um, breaks down that package, so it's all quite gory. Anyway, that was a little divergence, because, uh, yes, it's interesting. So where are we at? So this is the the results so far. So basically a team of us, including Michael, who's listening, has and Marinda, who's listening, have been out walking every 50 metres of all known populations and and some new populations. Um, again, I've, I've mentioned this before, but these are, these are all separated from each other genetically. So this is the results for Kiata and Salisbury up on the left hand side. We have walked every 50 metres to look at where are the, the Bursaria plants. And I mean, just because we find the Bursaria plants, I, I'm calling that ECB habitat, but obviously the ant has to be there, but that takes a long time. So we're just using density of Bursaria in lieu of going out or crawling around trying to identify ants of which there can be 130 species per hectare in uh, Western Victoria. <laughs> so uh, that's not going to happen. Just to quickly show you the difference, in, in the past, anyone who's gone to the Kiata population, this is the only information we had on where the little populations occur within that 90 hectare reserve. So in the past, this is from Beverly Van Prague. There's only three people have ever gone to Kiata, uh, I mean, formally. So Patrick Bond did it in 88 and mentioned that that one site had five populations, but there was no map and no data. Beverly Van Prague did it in 96, and she found them in these four little locations. Uh, and then Fabian Douglas went out again and went to similar locations to, to Beverly, I think. So chasing this data is fascinating because it made me realise, A, a lot of it isn't on the VBA. Fabian's wasn't on the VBA. Half of Beverly's wasn't on the VBA. And some of the data is in the wrong place. 
Um, so one thing I want you to do is just get all that data up there because it's very valuable. And the other thing was when you put the records on, some of them are wonky. So uh, those two yellow spots there, just ignore them. I don't, they're obviously wrong. But most of the people have seen them at this side that's on the roadside on the top left. That is a big population that Andrea Canzano did her catch and release at. It's got maybe 200 uh, Eltham Cobble Butterfly in it. And you can see, I think the red one's Fabian's and the uh, yellow one's uh, Beverly. So 94, they were still there. And 2011, they were still there. But nobody, oh, I think there's some records by in, by um, the local DELP office. So this population is still around. But as you can see from doing the mapping, what what used to be 90 hectares would say, oh, there's 90 hectares of Eltham Cobble Butterfly habitat. It's actually six hectares if you look at all the spots where there's any bursaria. So when you look at management of this site, if you only had a, a little budget, then you'd really just focus on the areas where there are any. Plus, I also think no one's ever been to these two extreme sites, the one up in the north, northeast and the one down in the southwest. So potentially we can expand that population to, to being bigger than we think. So, so it's basically extremely useful to do this mapping so that in the future we can uh, we can look at a has the bursaria changed you know exactly where the populations are can we extend it very useful information and this uh, as soon as the flying season starts marinda who's watching she's going to go out and survey all those sites and we're basically because we know those squares now we can do a standardized method so that we can start looking at how that population is traveling by all using the same survey technique that's what it looks like. It's been fenced in the past. There's been a lot of love gone into this site. There's uh, lots of people over the years, like all this Eltham Copper Butterfly work. There's a, I'm just a link in the chain of people who are doing lots of work. And this has got that one of the sites, this isn't a burn site. It's not It's not on the DELP burn regime, so that's not a threat. But what is a threat here is hares and weeds and potentially genetic isolation because those little populations within Kiata, they also look like some of them are separated from each other. Um, Salisbury, even less, it's pretty dire. Um, so there's only one, one uh, at the beginning when you looked at the Kalimna Park, the red and the, the, the dark orange and the, light or, the lighter orange is basically the dense patches of Bursaria and 97% of Eltham Copper Butterflies were only in them. So you can see from this, that's only 150 square metres that actually has dense patches. So you can see why it's pretty dire. But there's no way of knowing whether Bursaria have disappeared. Was it more dense in the past? I've got no idea. But they haven't been seen at Salesbury since 1993, despite uh, Beverly looking for them once and Fabian looking for them once. Um, so we'll look at again there, just in case. Um, and that's what it looks like. You can see the shrub layers just been hammered by grazing. And that one area where there are any Bursaria, which is tiny, has been fenced off from, from hares. That's some of the data from the VBA. Uh, Glenn Rudolph has been down there to seeing two at Salisbury, but he said that he didn't. So there's a bit of a VBA data issues there. Well, uh, basically, Marinda's been out and done all these roadsides uh, to try to look if there's any other potential ways of extending if that population that we've that Fabian found in Wales, where he found 21 Eltham Cobble Butterfly in, oh, sorry, in um, 2011, not 21. And this is what that looks like, super dense, but look at it, it's right on the edge of the road and it's so vulnerable to roadside works, it's not funny. And Fabian was saying this morning that uh, some council workers were out getting rid of, um, I think it was Briar Rose or something, and they were pulling it out, but someone managed to stop them in their tracks, which was lucky. Uh, and this is the Eltham site, so a big job going out and looking for Eltham copper butterflies over 1,200 hectares over the next two months with volunteers like Michael. And uh, and some contractors and myself all out walking, walking with our magic wands or sticks, tapping bushes on days that are hot enough and not windy over the next coming months. So threats, I think you've all guessed the threats really. More land clearing, small remnants are more vulnerable to you know all sorts of things. The smaller the area, the more vulnerable they are to weeds, pests. More competition there is for resources the less bursaria plants you can have, so the population is going to be restricted to, to, to how many plants there are. Uh, and different regions have got different uh, different threats. So obviously the plant burning is really big in Casamine and Bendigo because all of our searches 
focused on asset protection zones, which are near towns. So all of our populations are in asset protection zones, mainly because that's what we've looked for them. So all of them get burnt 80% fuel reduction every five to seven years, which is a disaster potentially for elf and copper butterfly because there's not that much fire ecology knowledge of this species. There's only one time they did it in Eltham and, it, and it, I don't think the outcomes were great in the short term. Um, genetic isolation, all these sites are separate from each other, both the three across the state and also within each region they're separated and also within each patch they're separated. So the sort of levels of genetic isolation. So maybe Castlemaine Botanic Gardens is declining because of that, because the habitat looks pretty good um, to me. But I mean, who knows? It could be something that ant needs that I'm not, we're not aware of. Um, roadside activities, Kiara, one of Kiara's big sites is right on the road and so is Wales. So that's two of six populations at Kiara uh, are right on roadsides. And everyone who's probably listening knows that roadsides are often have Telstra, pipelines, um, electricity suppliers, digging them up. A lot of weeds, uh, some sites, particularly Wimmera, grazing from hares and things. Lack of knowledge on the, on the, where they are, the new populations that we don't know of yet because we haven't really checked um, in climate change. So what to do about it? So this year, basically, uh, we've applied for a little bit more funding from DELP to try to look at maybe writing, uh, if I can, something as good as Patrick Vaughan did in 88 to see what management activities needed at each of these populations because they're all very different. Um, so we so say Kiata would be weed management, hair management, fixing the old fences, some some signage at Whale and at Kiata uh, on the roads, discussion with council, trying to get into whatever council plans there are to try to alert them or anyone who's doing any works there of that special site. Um, is there a possibility of linking sites up like um, Castlemaine Botanic Gardens to Walmart or something like that? Um, sites where they're at a risk, or even just increasing the number of Brassaria plants uh, if they're being grazed, for example, at Kiata between those small populations. Um, yeah, for North Central, the biggest risk is obviously plant burning. And the conservation advice from the feds is that given that Ailes and Cove butterfly and their low dispersal capabilities and that they only occupy discrete patches of Brassaria within the reserves, it's extremely vulnerable to the impacts of planned and uncontrolled burns. Um, so they have to develop an appropriate fire management regime that does not negatively impact them, their host ant or the Brassaria plants that support the ant nest. And that's a tricky one because Kalimna Park's right in the middle of Casamine, as are all the other sites. And it's been burnt twice in the last three years. Not all of it, but a big chunk where the major populations are. So, yeah, just very tricky. Um, so regionally, genetic rescue, making sure we manage a broader area, Find new, you know, it's actually going to take many years to try to look everywhere to make sure we're getting them all. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process, maintaining the enthusiasm of the community and trying to get the, uh, a lot of my focus has been trying to get the Elton Copper Butterfly Recovery Team together, which we've just had our first meeting in probably 10 years recently, so that we're, all our efforts are coordinated because I'd love to have proper entomologists really review what we're doing and just have oversight because we don't have Tim New and uh, Alan Yen anymore. And, but it's very difficult to find an entomologist. So working as a team, do the best that we can with the resources that we have available is just fantastic. Species monitoring, like I think this is Andrea and this is her amazing work. And these are a lot more uh, species monitoring for, for this species and other species. But I mean, this is an EPV solicited one. So if anything should be concentrated on, you'd think it would be this. But yeah, searching for new populations, which we're doing, tracking numbers and locations, so setting up standard methods across all sites, which I hopefully we'll do in this next round, and um, studying the habitat characteristics, the ecology, behaviour, fire ecology, you know, really building our knowledge would be fantastic. And Andrea's done an amazing job uh, of that. Getting landowners, next thing's private land, like getting people, I've, I've developed some simple tools, how to look for them, what they look like and just try to get people out having a look over the next few months, just to walk around with their magic wand tapping plants. It's just a great way to get fit. <laughs> um, I'm sure Michael can, uh, can uh, affirm that because it's uh, 20 kilometres a day. Um, encourage people to look for them, report them, use the butterfly app. You know, don't encourage not to use herbicides around these things to control weeds because the ants and, that are under, and the larvae are underground. 
and really pushing community because most of our scientific knowledge comes from amateurs. 80% of all mu museum specimens have come from amateur and, co and, collect and collectors. Most of our knowledge is from them. So it's a community effort to get this. It's not the government for sure. And uh, it's not just individuals like me and Carl and Julie. It's really a collective effort and it is fun. So, um, so we're uh, just coming up with the field trip the website and we'll be pushing these tools to help look for them and this is a bunch of good references and um, actually this site here this learn about butterflies that is amazing for details about sex and all that that I was talking about today that's come from there it's just a fantastic site the butterflies are straight up it's fantastic and um, so that's me standing with one someone sent me that and it didn't notice that butterfly but that's a uh, Thank you very much to Dale for supporting this year's Eltham Copper Butterfly Activities. And yeah, thank you for listening. And I hope um I hope you got something out of that. And any questions? Thank you so so much, Elaine. Um that's just fantastic. Um I'm just overwhelmed by how much knowledge you have and how fascinating um, the life cycle of this species is. I mean, if you haven't learned something, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so just having a look um, in the chat now, um, what have we got? So Stephen said that the Morency population was actually refound in January 2021, which Sounds like some good news. Um, so that was a comment. Um, Marinda said while she was looking, um, doing some elf and copper butterfly surveys, they also found a new population of the endangered Wimmera rice flower, which is fantastic too. Um, so Stephen has a question. It says, will the work result in Castlemaine, oh, sorry, will the work result in critical habitat determination under the FFG Act? Hmm. Will the sorry. work result, what does that mean? Sorry. Can you clarify, determine? Mm. I haven't actually looked at what the new FFG Act is, so he may be referring to, to the new one. Do you know, do you know, Megan, or anyone else could advise on that? Um, I'm not quite sure about um, the updates to the FFG Act, um, but I guess with the changes, it might be something to look into whether any of this works can kind of trigger a ha um, critical habitat determination. Habitat determination. I did one interesting thing I haven't mentioned was um, people said to me, when we tried to look for new Brasaria patches, people said, oh, we've done Eltham Copper butterfly habitat modelling, and I thought, Wow, that's good because uh, this is pretty obscure to try and find it. Like when when we were trying to spend precious and tiny resources to search, you know, I don't know how many ten thousand hectares or whatever, and and we've got to prioritise looking for them in a thousand hectares. I was like, where do we start? Obviously, we started in asset one protection zones because they're the most at risk. But it was like, so I looked. At, so we looked at um, the VBA for Brasaria records, but they didn't really help. They were kind of not that many because it's like a common species people don't tend to put in there and so the other thing we looked with nature kit has got elton copper butterfly habitat mapping but to be honest it was it's really broad it's like model any model a model is only as good as the data you put in and all that really put in i think was probably open dry forest so it was massive so it didn't help us narrow it down so if there was ways of narrowing down where we look it would be fantastic but at the moment i don't know what that is and most people don't know what the ants need. I mean, gosh, there's a whole world out there. Yep. Um, and we've got another question from Stephen. Um, he's asking, did the fire break work in Castlemaine and or have an impact on the Eltham Copper Butterfly? Good question. <laughs> um, uh, look, we're always... <sighs> Impacts on planned, bur planned burning um, I often find challenging in the box iron bark because and I never comment on other areas of Victoria for burning because some ecosystems burn a lot. You know, grasslands burn all the time. Rainforests hardly ever burn to be the two extremes. And in between, it's very complex. And uh, David Chiu developed tolerable fire intervals for each ecosystem that kind of gives you an idea of how often they can tolerate a burn. 
and then box hanging back 50 years is the average uh, of what we could tolerate, and in between that was 12 to 100. And um, but because um, because it's a kind of generic tool, DELP have to government things where they have to burn a certain amount, and so plan burning. Is a massive risk in the box. I'm back to everything that occurs here. It's published. There's comments on that from every good ecologist. That you, you know, all the really top ecologists. You'll find reports on them and submissions to the Royal Commission about box ironbark specifically. Um, so another thing that they're doing now, rather than burning, is they've got these strategic fire breaks, which I only learned about recently. And so we've been negotiating with them with the Field Naturalist Club and many passionate Castlemaine locals who are amazing, amazing human beings. To look at where they're putting them, what risks there are, you know, um, and so one of them goes through. So one of the questions is, do they go through Eltham Cove butterfly habitat? Uh, a, we don't always know where Eltham Cove butterfly habitat is if it hasn't been searched. And then B, the ones that we do know about is only that dot that I mentioned. We haven't properly mapped where they extend to. So there is going to be a huge fire break through Walmart, and they're going to burn, burn Walmart because they'll burn that quite often. Um, so we've mapped most of Walmart. Not, not all of it, but it's quite a big park. And so the strategic fire break team, who are actually really open to discussion, which is fantastic, we've given them all the data that I've got so far so that they can avoid burning any habitat in Walmart. We can't really comment on other areas because we haven't surveyed them, like Friars Town one and other places. So, so I would say that Justine's team are very open to discussion, which is and looking at real data, which is fantastic. Oh, thanks, Elaine. And we've got another question from Marinda. So Marinda asks, is bridal creeper a risk at the Castlemaine Bendigo populations? And if so, is it being managed and how? Uh, like I said, every region seems to have different management issues. And I'm speaking to Carl Eust uh, and Julie Radford because we'll start to pull together uh, the, uh, the three of us in Castlemaine for our populations to look at what management actions do we need, because it's fine spending all this money looking for things, um, but it's really important to result in actions. I don't want to just write plans, I want to get stuff done. So it's like, what are the issues in each region? And, you know, to talk to Fabian Douglas and Marinda and other people in the Wimmera to get make sure that they get specific management actions for their populations. So as far as knowing bridal creeper and individual populations in Castlemaine, I don't think so. We've got, but we do have other weeds at different sites, but each individual site has got different problems. Like so, bone seed is in one of them, but there's none of that in the Botanic Gardens. The Botanic Gardens in Kalimna Park probably has Riza and things like that that could that, that Tim New believed was a problem to get for the female to get down into the plant, but they're very difficult to manage. So yeah, I don't think bridal creeper is on top of our list, but it might be in the Wimmera. Um, thanks very much. That's so far. That's all the questions we've had. I guess just a personal one for me. If I was going out looking for the elephant copper butterfly, is there an optimum time of day to search for it, like morning, evening, middle of the day? It's a good question because I don't actually write this anymore. Because sometimes when you look at an old report, I, people reproduce what the old report says. And so they used to say 10 till 2. And so you do see that now and again, and Andrea's comment, so this will be interesting because she's a guru. Um, but when I've been doing it up in Castlemaine, and again, each region's different, but in Castlemaine, it can be bloody, it can be 30 degrees till like seven o'clock at night. So I've found them, when I'm out surveying and you've got to get a certain amount done in a day, and if I'm still seeing them, I'm going to keep going. So basically, depending on the conditions, they'll be still flying. I suppose ideally when it's in the middle of the day and it's hot, people are saying that's the main time. So 10 till 2 might be optimal, but basically I can see them right up until 6 o'clock. Yeah. Well, it'll be, it'll be interesting what Andrea says, because Melbourne might be a bit different. It's probably not as hot as here. Yeah. Clear sunny day with 20 degrees. The morning is better because they are warming up and a little bit slower and easier to see. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Um, cool. Um, all right, well, I don't think we've got any more questions. I've got a few people look like they're typing in the chat box, um, so we'll just give them a moment. But um, I guess um, on behalf of Delp, I'd love to thank you, Elaine, um, for this presentation today. Um, and a huge thank you to, as well, to Annie Hobby, who did a lot of the works behind the scenes, helping you organise this, and also Matt Bliss, who's 
working his wonders with a recording and getting everyone over to the right meeting. Um, Andrea, or just, Andrea's just said, she, I found as soon as it gets too warm, they tend to bunker down. So approximately between 28 and 30 degrees. Um, so yeah, it's been fantastic, um, this presentation today. Um, for, in the chat, there is the link for the field trip, which is happening so the 24th. Yep. Yep, on the 24th. So anyone who wants to join, um, the link to sign up for the event is in the chat. And the recording of this will be available on the SWIFT website and probably in the future on the Wetland Revival Trust website as well. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you. And then the, don't forget, the fee, if you're in Melbourne, the Facebook, the Eltham Copper Butterfly Facebook page that's run by Andrea and John Harris, then they're, they're, that's a great organisation to get involved in. And I'll get the website up soon for North Central uh, and Wimmera that'll show all everything that we've got done today, but maybe in a bit more detail, but it might be another couple of weeks. But the tools will be up shortly. Thank you very, very much to you guys, Megan and Annie for and Matt for fantastic support and getting this online rather than just being in the Dimbula RSL or not being in it, thanks to COVID. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for your for listening. <laughs>